challenges. Dann stellen Sie sich alle noch mal vor. Danach. Hello everyone, we're just going to wait a few, few more minutes for people to be able to register. So, salam alaikum, and we really proud to welcome you, I think, to a really outstanding webinar. Despite the limitation that it's digital, I think we will feel emotions. We like to share experiences and stories. And I'm Janet Ziuri the director of the Department of Gynecology and Oncology, and I am the current president of PARSCO, um, what was founded with Sarah Nasser. Hello, everybody. Um, lovely to be here tonight, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sarah Nasser. I'm a gynecological oncology fellow. I work with Professor Stavouli at the Charité Hospital in Berlin. Um, I'm originally half Lebanese and half Italian, and I'm co-founder and um, General Secretary of the Pan-Arabian Research Society for Gynae Oncology. So medicine is a science. Medicine is experience because most of the procedures we do in the clinical day is based on experiences. So we have two points, I think, what is different to the history in medicine. First is we have much more tailored treatments, but tailoring treatments start with tailoring the dialogues, the communication. And we know that we like to have a treatment decision-making process based on both parties, on the impact of the doctor and the impact on the patient. And that's the reason that the dialogue and the knowledge about expectation and preferences is in general the backbone of any tailored treatment. And this was clear for us since many, many years. And that was the reason why we, for instance, designed in 2010, the first brochure in Arabic about ovarian cancer and it was really funny because I just started a brochure in Turkish for the Turkish migrants in Germany. And then um, a colleague of me asked me why not in Arabic? And he was true because at the end of the day, cancer education information is cross national, cross cultural. And it was really funny because I took the German brochure and there's one chapter about nutrition and we have to modify it because you know, the German food recommendations may be different if a patient came from Morocco or from Lebanon. So I think what we do today is medicine. And the question what we have today as the backbone of this webinar is how we can make a professional structure to go in dialogue between patients and doctors and 
to use even experienced patients, as we will have today in our panel, to use them to moderate, to educate, and even to influence doctors in their clinical work, but even in clinical research. That's the reason why I'm so proud to be the co-chair with Petra from Engage, where we try to go in these directions. And today, we like to touch the Arabic woman, the Arabic world, to touch every woman in the world in bringing them in dialogue. And at least, in, in a level that both hearts can be touched, but even both brains. That is my introduction. I'm really proud to be here. And Sarah Nasser and the panel will make the best for the next minutes. And I'm again, thankful for this wonderful initiative. Thank you very much, Professor Sehuli, for this inspiring introduction. In fact, the first session um, of this webinar is called knowledge is power. We decided to call it that way. And knowledge is power doesn't just mean the knowledge from doctors passed on to patients, but also the knowledge from experienced patients passed on to doctors and on to other patients who have maybe newly been diagnosed who haven't gone the journey through. So this is an important point you mentioned. And I would like to start off with sharing um, a few slides with you about our project and how we how we decided to start this webinar. The society, the Pan-Arabian Society um, for Gynae Oncology, but also to give you a small overview of um, some information, some basic information on ovarian and uterine cancer. So my title is Recent Highlights in Women's Cancers. And it's part of the Women Empowerment Webinar, which we're doing today. This webinar is um, done under the umbrella ship of the Pan-Arabian Research Society of Gynecological Oncology, the PARSCO Society. And it's part of a sub-project of PARSCO, which is called iStart. And iStart is the digital Pan-African e-health network. The main aim of PARSCO and iStart is really to build sustainable, long-lasting cooperations, networks, and connections through digital solutions, um, but also face-to-face -face between doctors, patients, and communities who have an interest in the healthcare for women globally. And you will see in the chat, um, we will post links to register to PARSCO and also to register to iStack throughout the webinar. So feel free to click on them and register and also view all of our information. So the iStack project, is actually a project that's uh, involving many clinics and hospitals. Um, it's part of a Charité partnership with the Moroccan University Hospital and also a hospital in Mali. We were, we were recently also joined by Botswana and Guinea. And obviously we also have the PARSCO centers which involve the North African region as well as the Middle East. The main aim is to build an e-health network for education, exchange and dialogue about patient care. And the main advantages of the iStar project are we do monthly tumor boards, we do webinars such as this one, for example, and we will also do once a year a summer school, which is a three-day workshop um, where we teach and um, exchange knowledge uh, between healthcare professionals. This is not just doctors, but also nursing staffs and physiotherapists, for example. I won't go too much into detail, um, because this is quite specific for doctors, the tumor boards is basically, and this is one of the topics that we will discuss, it's a meeting, in this case it is a virtual meeting, you can see some of familiar faces uh, on here, where we discuss cases, so we discuss a patient who's presented, for example in Morocco, with possibly an um, cancer of the womb, and it's basically different gynecologists, different oncologists worldwide that are connected to this project who talk about this case and give the recommendations on how best <coughs> to counsel this patient about treatment. So generally it is beneficial for the patients because you basically get another opinion from experts around the world, which you would normally not be able to receive. And these happen once a month, every month. 
And so you see, these are digital networks that we're building. Um, they're currently tailored towards doctors and healthcare professionals, but, and this is the beginning of it, the first step, this webinar is going to also give room and scope for patient advocacy and for patients to obviously participate in these decision-making processes and in their own care. And this is why we're calling it the Women Empowerment Webinar. This is again a summary slide. Um, so you can see the link will be posted in the chat function. You can click on it and you can view all of our projects. For example, we also have a podcast in Arabic um, and we will hopefully also do podcasts in Arabic for patients, tailored for patients. And you will also have more information on all of our individual projects, educational, um, and you will also see more and more uh, patient tailored um, projects. So as we said that knowledge is power, I wanted to summarize a few main points um, about women's cancers to um, start the session. And unfortunately, this slide. So the first one, ovarian cancer. Um, ovarian cancer is cancer of the ovary, basically. And you can see in this picture that it's a, uh, it's a change, a tumorous change of the ovary. It occurs in one out of 75 women each year. And it's the fifth most common reason for deaths caused by cancer. And about 230,000 women are diagnosed each year worldwide. So that is actually one diagnosis every 24 minutes of ovarian cancer. So this is a relevant, a relevant diagnosis. Ovarian cancer has different stages. And by stage, we mean how far this cancer has spread. So Petra might recognize this. This is a picture from the Engage fact sheet, ovarian cancer fact sheet. And um, Petra will, will probably mention this as well to you. This is a fact sheet where the information is summarized for patients um, about different cancers, gynecological cancers. So three quarters of women are diagnosed at advanced stages, so stage three and stage four. And you can see here that stage three, for example, means that the cancer has already spread outside of the pelvis into the abdomen, so into the tummy area. And stage four means that it's actually spread to other body organs which are far away from the ovaries, for example, the liver or the lungs. And most women, 75%, so three out of four women are diagnosed at advanced stages. And there is currently no effective screening program for ovarian cancer, unlike, for example, breast cancer. When it is diagnosed, it's mostly diagnosed by ultrasound scan and also via some blood tests. There are some risk factors for ovarian cancer. And I think Sarah, one of our patients, will be telling you about one of the risk factors that, that she has uh, for ovarian cancer. And one of them is basically having a genetic mutation. About one in, uh, one in 10, uh, women will have ovarian cancer that is genetically related, so that is hereditary. And this is called the BRCA gene mutation. Um, also increasing age is a risk factor, race, ethnicity is a risk factor, and having a family history. The problem with ovarian cancer is that the symptoms that it, that it causes, um, they're very nonspecific. They could be attributed to many other diseases or illnesses. So for example, having trouble eating, or feeling full quickly, having some pelvic pain, so pain in the lower tummy, having upset stomach or back pain, or even feeling that the, the tummy is increasing in, uh, in width. And this is generally a reason because there is water in the tummy. Um, could also be bloating, feeling the need to go to the toilet very often. So these are symptoms that are very nonspecific and that most women may not think about going to the doctor straight away to get them checked. And this is why one of the reasons why ovarian cancer is also diagnosed in the early, uh, in the advanced stages. So just to kind of quick summary, the, the main treatment of ovarian cancer for when it first comes is generally a combination of surgery. So actually operating um, on, the, on the actual tummy. So most of the time that means removal of the womb and the ovaries, as well as any other organs that or places that are actually, that have tumor in them followed by chemotherapy treatment. And now recently, in the most recent years, we've become very good at immune therapy, which means that we can use cells in our immune system 
to actually treat the ovarian cancer or keep the ovarian cancer from coming back. One of them, and you may have heard of it, is called PARP inhibitor. And the PARP inhibitor is basically, you have a small graphic there, I, I won't go into it in too much detail, but it's part of, of a, PARP is basically part of the, the cells, the immune cells that help a normal cell repair damage that happens. Um, and when this cell, um, basically when there is a, a mutation, a genetic mutation, this BRCA mutation, then um, cancer cells with the BRCA mutation, they rely on these PARP cells to repair the DNA. So if you give this woman who has this BRCA mutation a PARP inhibitor, so something that stops these PARP cells, then they leave the cancer cells with no way to repair the damage. So then the cancer cells die. And this is why PARP inhibitors are so effective in women who have this genetic mutation um, in keeping the cancer from coming back. And this is why they're used in the therapy. This is now a quick overview on uterine cancer. So uterine cancer is basically cancer of the womb. And it's the sixth most common cancer worldwide with about 320,000 cases diagnosed every year in the world. The most common type of the cancer of the womb is the cancer that happens in the lining of the womb. And the lining of the womb is called endometrium. So it's called endometrial cancer. So endometrial or uterine cancer actually has more specific symptoms compared to ovarian cancer because most women come with some sort of bleeding problems, okay? And it's generally the first sign of this endometrial or uterine cancer. Um, usually, they come with bleeding problem or some discharge or bleeding in between periods, as well as pelvic pain, so pain because there is something there that's growing. And more than 95% of womb cancers occur in women over 50 years of age. There are also some risk factors for women developing this uterine cancer. One of them is, one of the most important ones is obesity or being overweight, as well as having a family history. So some of them are also genetically um, caused um, and having had any other treatments or um, for example, radiation. Really important in preventing endometrial cancer. So we said for ovarian cancer, it's, it's very difficult to actually have an effective screening program because of the way the illness is. And um, for endometrial cancer, we know that there is a risk factor which is increased body weight. So having excess body weight increases the risk, but being active decreases the risk. And actually we could prevent four in 10 cases of uterine cancer by being healthy weight and physically active. It is one of the factors. It's not the only factor, but it's definitely one of the factors. So lifestyle is very important. How do we treat it? Generally, the main treatment for, uh, for, for uterine or uh, cancer of the womb is removal of the womb, um, uh, so surgery. And it's the mainstay of treatment. However, if it's more advanced or when it comes back, then there can also be chemotherapy and also radiation therapy. Following that, we also have new therapies that are targeted towards the immune system, similar to the ovarian cancer, and also hormonal therapies. So what do we do for our patients in our clinic? And Professor Sehuli, you can also add if you want to. We have a lot of surveys um, because doing surveys is, for, sometimes for clinicians, you think, oh, well, it's, it's a survey, but actually it's extremely important because it's a way for patients to express their current situation. And we have in the German Cancer, Society, Oncology Cancer Society, we have a series of surveys, which has been going on for how many years now, Professor? Many years, years, more than 15 years, exactly. And this is called the expression series. And basically within the expression series, you can see a picture here, but we also have some flyers here. Oh, you can, I don't know whether you can see them. Um, and in the expression series, it's basically a survey for patients about their expectations uh, on different types of treatment, therapy, maintenance therapy for ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, and all other cancers as well. So there's different, um, different expression series. And um, we have these surveys and our patients are very active in actually filling them in and, and um, expressing really the current situation. And obviously also Professor Suhuli is um, chair of the Engage group um, together with, with Petra Adamkova and she will also tell you a little bit more about the activities. 
Um, we also, all of our surveys, as well as our patient information, we try and make them as multilingual as possible. Um, so obviously relating to Parisco, we, um, we have translated, as Professor Sudulik said, we've translated in Arabic. We haven't just translated the uh, information leaflet on ovarian cancer in Arabic, but we've also translated a leaflet on um, dealing with COVID-19 uh, and gynecological cancers in Arabic. And we've also translated some guidelines for treating gynecological cancers by the big uh, internet, European societies, we've translated those in Arabic as well. Also Turkish, Russian, I think as well, um, and uh, other languages, French, I think. Um, so we try and reach out to our patient uh, groups uh, as much as possible. So thank you very much. And with that, I will hand over to Petra, who will give you an overview on the Engage activity. So I will stop sharing. And Petra, you can uh, you can start sharing your screen. So thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Engage. Is, this is a European network of gynecological cancer advocacy groups. So uh, our network uh, includes uh, 73 European patients advocacy group uh, from uh, 29 European countries and was established in 2012 by ESGO. It's a European Society of Gynecological Oncology. And uh, we have three uh, just the goals, empowering, educating, and raising awareness. Uh, this is also our vision, prevention, and access to treatment uh, of uh, gynecological cancers, and empower patients advocacy group uh, to uh, have uh, bigger access to uh, care, research, prevention through education and awareness. So uh, let's uh, introduce me uh, our projects. Uh, we, every year, what, what we would like to, uh, to do or to how, how to engage all our patients group it's a personal meeting with all educational uh, seminars and topics. And every year we have patient advocacy seminar. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> Last year, because of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Oh, I'm sorry, really. Uh, it was online, but this year we have the opportunity to meet uh, uh, as personal in Prague and uh, because uh, we think that the cooperation with doctors is very important. Uh, our motto for this year was orange meets purple. It means that uh, you can see ESGO logo and uh, orange is the color of the logo and our logo is purple, engage, and it means patience. So patients and doctors or doctors and patients together and it's the it's our big message for all uh, patients in the world because together we we are able to do more uh, as Sarah mentioned uh, we have a lot of educational materials uh, they are written by patients and reviewed by ESGO members ESGO doctors and uh, you can find it on this uh, web website uh, in uh, many languages. Uh, you saw that we are a network of uh, many, many patient advocacy groups. So uh, the first language is uh, English. All these brochures and leaflets are, are in English, but we have a lot of translations in many languages. So you can uh, check this website and you can find what, what you can, uh, what you are interested in and just download it. What we also uh, developed is a clinical trials project together with NGOT, also with clinicians, because it's very important. 
and uh, we would like to uh, educate patients about clinical trials, about uh, uh, how how it how it works, how it's going on, and uh, because we think that only educated patients can be a partner for a doctor. That's that's the point. That's the key message uh, for our uh, our awareness or our projects. Uh, the most uh, visible projects may be uh, of ENGAGE is World Gynecologic Oncology Day. This is the abbreviation GO. Uh, so we, we said away World Go Day. And uh, it's uh, celebrated every year in, on September 20. And the main goal of this day is to raise awareness about uh, gynecological cancers about prevention, treatment possibilities, and patients' aftercare, about rehabilitation, nutrition, and so on. And also, it's, it's a very good um, point or opportunity uh, to communicate about this topic, also in media and in the society. Uh, you can see here pictures uh, from the last Go Day. Uh, we have a social media campaign and uh, I would like to invite all of you to join us next year because uh, it's, it's very important to raise awareness about uh, these gynecological cancers. And uh, the motto of this year was information is power, but communication is the solution. And I think we will keep it to the future um, uh, because it's, it's really true. And uh, maybe as Professor Sehule said, the education together. So information is power, but communications and education is the solution. Uh, other projects, what <laughs> again, education is, is uh, uh, key. Uh, we have here educational and best practice sharing webinars uh, during the whole year, and we also have uh, so-called quality of life projects, and uh, we choose every year uh, special topics, and for this year and for the next year we will have sexual health topic and menopause. Uh, surveys, very important thing. Uh, it's collection of, of real data from patients and it's very important to have these surveys and, and ask patients uh, about uh, things that they are important. And uh, the last year we have a uh, perspective of patients with gynecological, uh, oncology cancer, with gynecological cancers during uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And it was also published in a medical journal. And last but not least, uh, this is quite a new project and it calls Engage Teens. And we would like to raise awareness about HPV vaccination. And this is a task for younger generation. So uh, we, this is a project for girls and boys from all the world from 13 to 19 years. We educated them and uh, we uh, approached them to uh, spread, the, spread the world and uh, spread the awareness about HPV among uh, their schoolmates and, and friends and uh, other people in the family. Uh, to be aware about uh, facts of uh, HPV. So thank you very much. It was a brief uh, introduction of uh, Engage Network. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to ask or to answer. Thank you. Yes, Petros, thank you very much. And I think our recent initiative, even, um, even to bring it to the panel list and even to the audience, uh, we have designed a webinar series to train the advocacies to learn much more details about clinical trials, how the idea can be translated in the real world, what are the um, scientific backgrounds of the clinical trial, how to interpret it, how to make the next step. And I'm already, always impressed by the understanding of patients, despite the fact they are not really born as scientists. 
And I think, especially if we talk about outcomes, about patient reported objectives, we need a dialogue and we need even to modify our clinical trials. Because if we talk about progression free survival, what means this from the patient's perspective? Do we make the radiologist happy or the patient? What is the meaning that the tumor marker decreased? But how we can translate this drop down to the daily activity in the social, in the family context? I think this is what we can design new. And that's the reason I think, again, that patients' experiences, patients' perspective is part of medicine. And that's what I really love. And I'm really proud to work with you, Petra, on this uh, global initiative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Petra. And thank you, Professor Uli, for this comment as well. And we hope that as far as go, um, we can learn from Engage um, and also cooperate in the future together with Engage in order to, to build our patient advocacy um, groups and, and take this further. Thank you so much, Petra. Again, feel free anybody to comment in the chat. We're receiving a lot of positive comments in the chat and ask questions um, throughout the entire webinar. We will address them when, when we read them, basically. So then it is my pleasure to move on and to introduce uh, Joël Abu Khalil. Um, Joël is, um, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself quickly before you start, but basically Joël will be our patient advocacy representative in the PARSCO um, society. And uh, she has a lot of experience with patient advocacies and her, has herself the patient advocacy group. And she will talk about her journey and cancer survivorship. Joelle, thank you very much for joining today, please. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, Dr. Sahudi, uh, for this opportunity and for welcoming into the PARSCO family. Um, wow, I didn't prepare anything, uh, a presentation. Uh, I will put in the, of course, I will be talking on my initiative, but I'm really, really proud and really honored to be part of the PARSCO because I feel it really is aligned with the Matilda mission and that we will be accomplishing great things together with Engage as well, because I myself also, um, I'm Lebanese and I started Matilda in Lebanon but I'm also on the board for the Network of Gynecolog Against Gynecological Cancer in Sweden, and we're part of the Engage family as well. So I feel really proud that Matilda can be able to be part of these two great organizations and grow together with you. Um, I started Matilda as an initiative to honor my mother who passed away in ovarian cancer. And I hope to bring in uh, also another perspective as a caregiver, not just a patient advocacy. Because like you say, uh, like you said, Dr. Sahuli, uh, it is really important to have that communication between a patient and a doctor, but also between a caregiver and a doctor being in the middle between the patient and the doctor. Uh, and I think that really applies to the Middle East in particular, because as you all know that cancer is still a taboo and in, in part of that world in many uh, perspectives and also in Sweden, I've noticed that it's still, and it's hard to talk about it. It's hard to even say the word cancer for many of us. And that is something that I wanted to change with Matilda. And I'm mirroring back to myself because, you know, I say things sometimes that I have difficult dealing with, and this only inspires me more uh, to, you know, to be empowered. And I love the title woman empowerment because for me, woman empowerment is not just, you know, empowering women. And it's not just because I am a woman, it's because I am empowered by other women around me. And, you know, my mother was one of them with her strength and, um, not only with her strength, her name represents the strength. It means strength in German, actually, mighty in battle. It's a German name. And that was what inspired me to actually call it Matilda because of her name and of who she was and what she represented in terms of strength and endurance. Um, 
in her struggles. And I think survivorship uh, is a daily struggle for everyone who deals with cancer in one way or the other. Um, not only patients, caregivers, everyone. So that has been also a, a huge part of Matilda's mission is to create a safe space for women, to empower them, to tell their stories, to hold space for them, and to also be of support to their families. And this is what I truly believe in, because I believe when we empower women, we, be, we empower a whole family, a whole nation. And, and caregivers and loved ones deserve to have that support system as well. Uh, so that is Matilda's mission in general, because, you know, it is difficult. And I think true strength lies in us being vulnerable and being supportive of each other when we are vulnerable so that every woman can feel not only empowered in terms of feeling strength, but also empowered when she is vulnerable and to be uplifted by other women. And that is my mother's legacy, basically, and that's what I want to accomplish. And before I end this, because I'm not going to talk much, I want the patients to share their stories. Again, thank you so much for this opportunity and for the iStart project, you know, Karim and everyone behind this for doing this, making this happen today. And, and I look forward to telling you more about my story later on. But what I, want, what I really want to say as well, and to end this is, you know, I just think that it's important for us to collaborate. And Matilda started off in the Middle East, and now I'm, you know, really active in Sweden and part of Parsco. Uh, and I think that it's important for people to not only be heard and seen, but also to have a platform, to have a support system. And I've been really privileged to have that, you know, with people around me, with my family, with, with everyone when I went through all of this with my mother. And not everyone has that opportunity or privileged enough to have a support system. And so I want everyone to know that they have that with us with Matilda and with Parsco, and they can reach out anytime to us. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to hear all these brave, pa brave patient stories. I think you are really brave and really like, thank you for doing this and for being an inspiration for others. And I hope in the next webinars also we will have caregivers and other people that will also share their stories and bring that to life so that we can move forward together and create something, not for the Middle East, but globally when it comes to women's health, because a woman's well-being is important for the whole family. Again, so thank you so much. And I will be putting my Instagram so you can follow me and listen more to my story there. And we'll be discussing more afterwards. But first, I would like to introduce you to you, our first patient. Uh, and someone that I met through social media. Sometimes social media is good. <laughs> it has its positivity when you can reach out to people even when you're not in the same country. So Joanna, thank you for uh, tuning in from Lebanon. I will let you introduce yourself and talk about your story. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Joanna, I'm Lebanese. Uh, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer three years and a half ago. Um, first, let me thank you for having me today. I'm very honored to be part of this webinar. Uh, my story began like uh, four or five years ago. I had like a cyst on one of my ovaries, um, but it was a benign cyst. So my gynecologist just told me to monitor and the day when it starts uh, affecting my period, then we will uh, make a small surgery and uh, remove it. So, um, in 2017, November, October 2017, I started having like spotting uh, during my periods. And um, the second month I had uh, to go and see him, my gynecologist. And he told me maybe it's time to remove this uh, cyst. Uh, so I went and I did like a small surgery. 
uh, and they took, it's like it was the cone biopsy, as I remember. Um, and after the results were out, it turned out that I have uh, the cervical cancer. Uh, so um, I was shocked. Um, I cried. I called my mom. I remember I called my mom. I cried one time. That's all. I told her I have cancer. I'm going to cry now and then I'm going to stop and then I'm going to go start doing my research and checking with doctors uh, to see what should be done. Um, so I took the opinion of uh, many doctors and actually one in the United States um, and they all had the same um, answer to remove everything like the total hysterectomy, the full hysterectomy. Um, so I went into surgery, uh, I removed my ovaries, my uh, uterus, the, all the glands around and the cervical. Um, um, but I was lucky enough not to have any treatment done. It was only a surgery, but my cancer was like three centimeters uh, stuck to my uh, cervical wall. Um, it was a really big surgery. I had like uh, a month for recovery. I had like 150 stitches uh, from outside and 250 from inside. So, um, but um, usually this cancer is the adenocarcinoma. Usually it's uh, rare to find it at the beginning and to give signs as I did my research and I asked. Uh, but uh, I had such a big faith and um, uh, I was lucky, really lucky to have the symptoms uh, showing and to catch it at the beginning. Um, but thank God, everything is good now. It's been three years and a half. Um, I had so many support from my family and my friends. And honestly, I don't know when I had this um, a big uh, power of positivity uh, that just like came to me and uh, I was strong enough to go through this uh, with, with a smile always on my face with every pain I was going through and uh, even though I cannot have kids anymore and I'm into induced menopause I'm having all the hot flashes at, the, at a very early age uh, but I always thank God for everything. I'm still alive today. And I thank God for that. And of course, my doctors. And that's, uh, in summary, my, uh, my story. And we would like to thank you, Joanna, for, for sharing your story. And, uh, you know, it's not easy, but it's, it's, it's always uh, nice to hear when someone so young has been through so much can share her story with a smile on my face. Yeah, I'm happy to share it because actually uh, here in the area in the Middle East, uh, no one talks about it. Exactly. And they consider it as a taboo. I don't know why. Uh, it's actually, it's not like we've looked for cancer. Cancer <laughs> looked for us. And uh, exactly. it's very important to share this awareness and to talk about it and to always do the, the yearly checkup with the gynecologist, no matter what you feel. Because once you uh, catch it at the beginning, it's a, it's a life uh, savior, actually. Yeah, exactly. And thank you so much for Barbara Nassar, Association for introducing yeah, us. Thank you. And we will look forward to work and together more with you and of them. Course. Of course. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Well, and again, from our side as well, for sharing this personal story. Um, it's very appreciated. And Patterson, you had a comment. I only want to um, comment that woman cancer is still a taboo in every country, in every individual region. And we learned something from breast cancer that's much more available in the, in the, in the press and even in, in the societies. But we know especially of cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, and endometrial cancer is very complicated. So I. I uh, founded the journal, The Second Voice, uh, 10 years ago, 11 years ago. And we have always a picture of a real patient because I told them from the beginning, I want real persons. I don't like to buy a picture from the internet. And it was very difficult to find women. They really are um, confident enough 
to show it. But it's step by step much better than before, but we have to fight to make this disease as a disease and even to show that the people behind the disease are so attractive, are so powerful mm -hmm. that we can talk with them. But first is that we can start our dialogue. If we are not confident to talk between doctors and patients, mm -hmm. patients with patients, doctors with doctors, we cannot expect that the society will break this taboo. So that's really important. And again, I will tell you, Germany, you think it's they're very modern, but they are still, still trying to run away if you touch this topic. Sexuality, uh, dialogue with partners, with the children, with your woman um, empowerment. It's always still something like an adventure. So even we like to learn from you and we like that you even motivate and inspire the women in, in Germany and Europe all over the other countries. So that's only my comment to this. Absolutely. I can only I can only agree and echo that those feelings as well. And you know, like you said, you are all brave and you're all powerful and more powerful than what we actually, what you yourself may actually think at the beginning. So thank you again for being here and being such a source of inspiration for us today. Thank you. Yes, and I cannot agree more. You know, it's the, in Sweden, we have the same issues like in Germany, unfortunately, everywhere. Uh, this is a very sensitive topic, but we are already breaking the taboo right now. Hopefully this will be the beginning to, you know, thank you, Dr. Suhuli, for empowering all of us women, really. This is, this is amazing. And I've witnessed so many, uh, you know, developments the past few years since my mom died eight years ago. Until now, so much has happened. And I'm looking forward to, you know, be, being that force of change with all this beautiful woman. And we have now two more patients. Sarah or, or Nefat Terry, would you like to go? Who would like to go first? Sarah? Yeah, sure. Oh, Sarah, <laughs> go ahead. Sarah is also a patient that I met through Instagram, through my platform, and I'm so happy that she shared the story there. You can listen to it more there as well, but now she will uh, tune in from Dubai, right? Yes, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you, Joelle, and thank you uh, for the uh, amazing uh, organizers and doctors of this uh, Congress. Thank you for this opportunity. So my name is uh, Sarah Samad. I'm originally Lebanese, but living in uh, Dubai in the UAE. So my story, I relate completely to what Joanna said. My story actually started as a caregiver when in 2018, my younger sister back then, she was 28 and today happens to be her birthday actually. So my younger sister was diagnosed with, or she self diagnosed herself. She had the lump with breast cancer. So uh, I, her journey started, unfortunately, she had breast cancer at 28. Uh, she's absolutely fine, thank God, right now. But since she got that diagnosis at a young age, she had uh, gene testing. So uh, she was tested for, uh, for gene mutation and she happened to be BRCA2 positive. So by default, I had to, we all had to check ourselves. So I had uh, the gene mutation. So after that, I was going through the regular screening and uh, uh, tests to make sure that I don't have breast or ovarian. So a, a year after, uh, in August 2019, actually, I was going for my uh, regular uh, scan and blood test and uh, back home. We were actually planning a family vacation after a couple of days. So instead of actually going and traveling, I ended up with a stage 3C ovarian cancer. So the CT scan actually showed that it was everywhere. Uh, the symptoms that uh, Dr. Sara mentioned, uh, the bloating, the frequent ur urination, the fatigue, everything, I actually had those for months, if not years before that, but I did not think anything of them. I'm a very active person. I, wasn't, I didn't have any health conditions. So I thought it was just fatigue. It was my lifestyle. I'm just 
traveling a lot and such. So it never occurred to me. I never visited any doctor, not even, I mean, specifically never a, a, a gynecologist because I didn't have any issues per se. So after that, on August 28, I, my journey started. Uh, of course, when I first heard the, the news, I was, I was shocked. I was in denial. I, I, couldn't, I, I, I couldn't understand what was happening, especially that a year before, we already had cancer in the family. So it was a huge shock for, for everyone. I did not tell anyone. I couldn't tell anyone. I, couldn't, I, I needed time to really grasp or cope with the idea. I went to a lot. I, I visited so many doctors with the hope that one of them would tell me that, no, that's not, it's just, uh, it's a mistake. You don't have ovarian cancer. I would sleep and wake up hoping that it was a dream or a nightmare, but it didn't. So I got to a point where I need to accept that and move forward with the, with, the, with the treatment or I would go ignore and go downhill. So I had no choice but to accept the fact that I have advanced ovarian cancer. So then the journey started. I had the full debulking uh, surgery. I had what was called as a HIPEC, which is uh, the uh, uh, intestinal uh, chemotherapy. Then after recovery, I uh, had six cycles of chemotherapy which ended in January 16, 2020. I was, I mean, this was a huge celebration for me. I wanted to get back to my life, to get back to my routine. Unfortunately, the world locked down after a couple of months, it was COVID. I also lived through COVID, but I mean, with, with great fear of, because I was still recovering toward my immunity. And then I came back here to Dubai thinking that, okay, a switch, I need to forget what happened and just move on with my life. But it, it, it wasn't as easy. For me, cancer was something which I knew what to expect even to some extent, but what was harder for me, and this is something for, uh, that adds to the discussion that happened a while back, what is harder and what no one talks about is life after cancer is the ups and downs about life after cancer, how to get back to routine, how to recover from the, from the scars, both the physical and the mental scars, how to really cope with everything around you. So that I started my journey, a point I, I forgot to mention, uh, I think I took more than my time, but during treatment, I wasn't comfortable talking about my cancer or my treatment. I would just block everyone or would not talk about it. But the day I finished my treatment, I decided that I need to be and talk about ovarian cancer specifically, because as the, the, the panel mentioned that breast cancer is out there, but ovarian cancer and women, other women cancer are like minimally talked about. I never heard about ovarian cancer. I only knew it's out there, but I had no idea about ovarian cancer. So I had my own Instagram account. I started talking about my experience, started talk, sharing about the symptoms, sharing what can be done, talking about uh, family history, talking about the, the, the gene mutation, doing my role. This is now, I feel that I have to do this. I have to talk about it to support other women and to have, I mean, hopefully no one can go would go through this uh, this experience. Here I am now, January. Hopefully, hopefully, I'll be two years chemo free. I'm back to my activity. I'm back to my life. I'm coping ups and downs like everyone else, and everyone would know that. Hoping every six months that my scans would be clear and that nothing would come back, but taking it one day at a time and trying as much as possible to do my duty and do my role in such webinars and such uh, settings. And I salute each and every one of you for, for everything you do and uh, would always be happy to, to support and uh, always talk about, uh, I have a hashtag that I started talk about the OC. I would always, always, always talk about the OC because it's something really dear to me. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for sharing. And um, thank you. Th thank you for deciding to share your story on your platform uh, with other women. And uh, we look forward to hearing more about your life and your 
daily struggles because we all are, you know, dealing with survivorship is a daily struggle and healing is an ongoing process. So we're all in this together. So thank you for always being so supportive as well. Thank you, Sarah, as well from, from our part. Yes, <laughs> and, and, and another comment. So uh, science is generally very vertical. So they do surgery, they look what is the outcome of surgery and give chemo and they give uh, the result of the chemo. The secret of really medicine, especially in gynec cancer, is to see always the whole story. So storytelling is really science because what is the impact on the medical intervention on the short term, but even on a long term aspect. So that's what you're doing even to express your story and even to give updates is so valuable because if you talk with a patient as a doctor um, and you can show a patient who had already this experience as something different. And that was the reason why we started even our cancer survivorship where we made an exhibition where we asked patients who survived five years, 10 years, 20 years. And then we asked them what was the energy, the resources, what give you the power to overcome this crisis, this complicated situation. And I have many patients, they came now in my office and they asked me, please, Professor, I want to do everything to be once in this exhibition. And we just started a project, a charity, where we identified cancer survivors and we educate them, even in communication, in dealing with conflict situation. And these patients are helping patients who are at the beginning of the disease, but it's optional. So the, the trainer, the coach can decide however they want to do it. And even the patient in the beginning of the story, and they define how many times they meet, if it's by WhatsApp, by email, or by telephone, or by cooking, whatever they want. So, but I will only motivate you, fix your stories. And we we make patients here, and I think uh, Mrs. Medley from yeah. Moscow is even available in the audience. She wrote a book, which is from Russian, about her story. And she wrote it in German and in Russian. And we have another patient, she is a very famous um, painter and an uh, actor, and she made uh, a comic about the city of Berlin, and they came to me and I asked her, why not make a comic about your disease? And she wrote a comic about the stories, and it's very funny because the doctor, the doctor she met in the beginning, um, told her it's because she has pain in the hip. Make it open, please. Um, and she asked um, what you can do against the pain in my hip. And she said, nothing so much. So our camera is a little bit confused at the moment. One second, because he's so inspired <laughs> by the story. Um, and make it open, open, much more. So um, she went to the doctor, he was autobatic. She had pain in the hip. And she started in the book, the figure that the doctor said, yes, it's a hip, but it's not cancer. One week later, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. She's now survived 10 years. And she went back to the doctor and she said, I survived the cancer, but my pain in the hip is still there. So the way he was very confused, but I think it's so important that you fix your story. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. That you fix your story and you share it and you disseminate it to inspire as well other people who are going through the same and who are in, can identify with your story. Um, and we're receiving lots of comments in the chat of, of people saying, I can identify with your story. And so this is, this is great. This is what empowerment is about. And you've showed us the book. Um, and so our, our, our patients, they express themselves through writing, through drawing, through singing music, through art. We also have here a, a piece of art, and it's made with moss. 
um, believe it or not. <laughs> it's made with moss and some, some stones as well. Professor, do you want to tell us the story of the lady that gave us this, this present? Yeah, she came last week to me and she she suffered from endometrial cancer many years ago. And uh, she loves the hospital, so I, I, I was really surprised. But nevertheless, um, it's I think it's important that you go back yeah. in your personality and to look what is your competence, what is your creativity. Some of the women, they take something new, and some of them, they go in their talents they already have. Mm -hmm. This is resilience. Resilience is to express at the end of the day, it's even not the product, it's more the process. Yeah. But if the process is ending in the product, what is really nice, why not sharing this? Mm -hmm. And this is the reason why arts can really have help to go and dialogue with other people, but yeah. even to go and dialogue by our, ourselves. So we introduced since three years in this hospital creative writing. So patients, sometimes it's, it's easier to write or to make calligraphy. We made, it made it also the same as calligraphy and other likes maybe to make painting. So this is really important. What I think can even overcome and that's even coping what it means. So I like it. I love it. So again, congratulations. And yeah. I know my respect of you that it's not easy to, to go back in a in a memory where everything was paralyzed, yeah. where you've been alone, really alone, despite your environment and family, because at the end of the day, it's your own decision to go or not to go. That's even yours. That's I think really important, even for the doctors, we can support, but at the end of the day, it's your your health and even your engagement, what you need to be satisfied and even to be uh, successful in anything you really want to do. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself, Dr. Sahuli. I think, like I said, again, woman empowerment starts within and every woman needs to cope in her own way. And creativity is certainly a very, very good tool. Maybe we can, you know, uh, try to figure out a project that will be for the Middle East and all the countries through Charité and first go and do something creative online. Absolutely. But be the next. next. Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> I would love it. Next lady. So our last patient is uh, joining us from New Jersey, Nefa Terry. Go ahead. Hi, thank everyone, you. and thank you uh, for having me here. It's an honor to be able to share my story. Um, my journey with um, gynecologic cancer. Um, for the first time, I was diagnosed uh, in 2013 with endometrial cancer. I had had some um, heavy bleeding um, starting in September of uh, that year. Um, and at the time, I had a very busy schedule. You know, I was a nurse, working as a nurse at the time. Um, I had just gotten married um, that year as well in July. But um, with the heavy bleeding, um, I didn't go to the, um, you know, to the doctors to find out what was, you know, why I was having that bleeding. But I did know that it was abnormal, you know. Um, so I did, you know, in November of that year, I did go uh, to the um, emergency room. One morning I woke up and I was very weak, you know, I guess from, you know, losing blood for, you know, that much blood for about two months. Um, and I went to the emergency room um, and I was kind of, you know, dismissed in a way when I explained to the doctors what I was going through. And I think it was mostly because of disparities, you know, um, you know, the color of my skin. And also I was a young woman at the time I was 33. Uh, so they wanted, they told me that the bleeding could have just been, you know, a, um, a change in cycle. Um, and then some other things, uh, but I kind of, and they wanted me to go home and, you know, they said they would pro provide, I also had some lower back pain. So they said they would uh, prescribe some ibuprofen and uh, for me to go home and rest for about a week. But I knew it wasn't that, you know, I knew something was going on with my body. So I kind of pushed back and said to them that I wasn't leaving uh, the emergency room without some sort of, you know, exam or answers. So essentially they did, you know, 
have me see a, a tech who performed a transvaginal ultrasound on me and they were able to see, you know, where I was bleeding from. Um, and essentially they got me uh, connected with a gynecologic um, specialist. And uh, I saw that gyne uh, made an appointment and saw that gynecologic specialist and that, that particular doctor did a DNC and it came back that I had endometrial cancer. Um, and so uh, I was you know, treated with hormonal uh, treatment um, for about nine months and, and it, it, you know, it worked, you know, the cancer, I no longer had um, endometrial cancer, but I would continue to go into the, um, to see the oncologist every three months to have a biopsy because I didn't have surgery, I still had my uterus. And so during the third biopsy, um, after uh, completing the um, first you know, initial treatment, it was found that I had a recurrence of endometrial cancer. So you know, at that point I was 35, you know, and as I said earlier, I was, you know, had gotten married at 33 and our plan was to have children. So uh, I, that's why I you know, kept my uterus. So at this point, you know, we, I had a recurrence and so I needed to have a, uh, hysterectomy. So I did have an hysterectomy and they removed the uterus only. Um, so I was left with the fallopian tubes, uh, over, both my ovaries. And I continued to um, go to see the oncologist. And that particular oncologist that I was seeing at the time, she was no longer, she had left the practice, so she was no longer my oncologist and I got a new oncologist. Um, so uh, in 2018, um, during a routine checkup, um, I found out that I had ovarian cancer. I didn't have any symptoms. Um, so, you know, I stayed on top of, you know, my um, follow-up care appointments. So I, I thank God that, you know, I was diligent enough to do that. And the ovarian cancer was caught at an early stage. So at that point, I had, um, you know, surgery to have my uh, ovaries and everything removed, the fallopian tubes, you know, just everything removed. Um, and then uh, going back a little bit to the endometrial cancer at the oncologist that I was seeing at the time, I had asked her if, you know, I should, you know, be genetically tested for, um, you know, the cancers that I had or any other cancers, my risk of getting any other cancers. And I was told, that you know there was no association, you know, genetic association. So now going back to the ovarian cancer, at that time it was the oncologist that I had. She, you know, immediately had me ha go in to have a genetics testing, and it came back that I do have Lynch syndrome, um, which is associated with both endometrial and ovarian cancer. So now I knew, you know, the answers as to why, you know, I have these two cancers. And then I also found out that it, you know, runs in my family, the ovarian cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, which is also associated with Lynch syndrome. And also I had an, uh, a couple of aunts who had breast cancer. But, you know, as we talked about here today as taboo, so we're not really, you know, talking about it, you know, having these diagnoses and even in the Americas. Uh, so I decided, you know, that I would, you talk about it and share as much as I can um, as a way to help, you know, other women and, and also, you know, most importantly, to spot the signs and the risk factors. Um, so I, you know, attended, started attending a support group for ovarian cancer. When I was diagnosed with uh, uterine cancer, there were no support groups. I didn't have anyone to talk to or to relate to. So it was kind of, you know, lonely, but I rely heavily, you know, on my faith uh, and God to uh, carry me through. So um, I'm the, I, you know, attended support groups, had an organization uh, called Share, and then eventually I started, you know, working for Share on when they started the uterine support for uterine cancer, and also outside of Share, sharing my story and doing outreach to help um, other women go into this, and most importantly. To me, it's because, you know, it's Black women, you know, uh, women of um, African descent. 
because our voices are not really heard and been seen in a lot of these spaces. So I'm gonna continue my work in doing that. Um, and um, again, I give um, all praise to God for me still being here today and allowing me to be able to share you know, my experience wherever I can. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Nefateri. And thank you for being an advocate for you know for women of colors and we will support you uh you know whenever you need to you need us to and that's uh, yes because i would like to yeah i would like to thank all three patients uh, uh, for sharing your stories thank you so much ladies so because um Julie, this is maybe one of the topic we can even uh, discuss it in the next webinars because Lynn syndrome mm -hmm. is even in Europe not everywhere aware. We know we have the BRCA story, ECA, um, based on Angela Jolie, mm -hmm. but I can tell you Lynn syndrome is not really known in the, in the doctor's world. And what you said, it's, as you say, with colon cancer, it can be with brain tumors, and it can be um, attributed, as you said, it was a variant, endometrial. And many of these syndromes are diagnosed based on the gynecological malignancy, and then they ignored the other uh, stories, and they need a different patient surveillance than a classical and even for the relatives, but even for the treatments. The treatments are even now just completely different if a patient will have Lynch syndrome or not. But this, I can imagine, is relevant for our community. And we will do this in Engage, but we will do it, I think, even in ISTARC. Uh, and even uh, we need your support to pressure the doctors, because in most countries, there's no specific cover program for these patients. And they are much more frequent than you believe. Because if they don't, if you're blind, you will see nothing. But if you open your eyes, you will see there are many, many women affected of this syndrome. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I can only echo what Professor Sahuli um, is saying. And also again, thank you very much to all three of you ladies uh, for sharing your personal stories with us today. Um, and for being such an inspiration. Um, we already have some questions uh, from, the, from the audience in the, in the chat. So maybe we can, we can say the questions and, um, and ladies, you, you feel free to answer them. And then obviously if anybody wants to answer the questions from, from the audience, then they can either raise their hand and we can unmute them, or you can just answer the question, give you a comment in the chat. So um, the question is, with your, with your stories, how could you resist the stigma that you faced from other people due to your health problem? What experience did you have? Who wants to maybe start giving a comment? Sara, I see you, you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, can, uh, I can share. It wasn't... I mean, having another member of the family uh, a year before having cancer, then myself, it was initially for me, when I first had my diagnosis, I felt shame and I can say it back then. I felt ashamed. I felt that I was, I should hide it. I shouldn't talk about it. There's something wrong. Then it took me a couple of some time to realize that there's not absolutely nothing about it. It's a disease like exactly just like diabetes, like hypertension, like any other disease. Why, why this feeling? Why, why the taboo? Even, even from a family perspective, oh no, I shouldn't talk about it for my family, for my... Then, then I realized that after I finished treatment, because during my treatment, like I said, I wanted to just focus on myself, focus on my treatment, uh, focus on, on my well-being. Once I was done with that, then I decided to talk, not because of any stigma, but because I had priorities back then. But yes, I, I had those feelings uh, at the beginning of my diagnosis, at the beginning of my, of my uh, treatment, even, of course, for chemo, uh, the side effects, the, how I looked, everything, everything was like dark and black for me. But with time, 
and with again faith with uh, with and for me specifically i saw my sister and i saw how she fought and where she where she was this gave me inspiration so i always call her my lucky charm because because of her i got to know that i had cancer but she also helped me in so many ways because i was her caregiver but the, the, the feeling is always there initially, the taboo, the shame, the whatever, but at the end of the day, you just need to focus on yourself. Nothing else matters at that stage. Thank you, Sara, you're, you're absolutely right, and it's, it's very difficult. Nafatara, you've raised your hand, would you like to add and share your story? Yes, in terms of um, stigma, I you know, agree with, uh, with Sarah said, I also felt very ashamed uh, when I was diagnosed and I also felt like it was my fault, you know, somehow something I did or didn't do. Um, but as I, you know, I cried like every day for four months straight, you know, and then one day, you know, been washing my face, uh, I just felt like, you know, I heard, you know, this may seem unreal to some people, you know, but I feel like I heard God's voice in my head saying, stop crying, you know, this is, not gonna, you know, make you get any better, but continue in this fight, you know, and to get and learn as much as I can, you know, could about it, you know, and and also it allowed me. I didn't really share my diagnosis with so many people, maybe three people uh, in my family because of that shame. And then um, in sharing my story, I was, you know, I was empowered, and the more I learned about it, helped me, you know, to uh, through it as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, Joanna has answered in the chat, right? Do you wanna, do you want us to read it? Uh, it's okay. I can talk if. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, uh, actually, from my part, it wasn't uh, like being ashamed. It was like um, I was still young. I had no kids, and I was thinking like, if I'm gonna meet any man now, uh, any man would like to have a family. And I cannot provide this. So um, it was really um, like it made a blockage for me um, not to meet anyone anymore because it's, it's going to always uh, close up in my face when he hears that I cannot have kids, I'm in a menopause at this young age and everything. But then I just like spoke to myself and I said, why, why am I going to stop my life because of kids? Um, this is not life. This, the life is me, me being happy, me being surrounded by, surrounded by the people I love, me uh, having in my life um, something that makes up to not having kids. This is why I got myself a second cat. I surround myself with my nieces and uh, I found a job actually that makes uh, uh, toys for kids. So it's like Everything comes in your life at the end. It's like God sends you this uh, road that he opens up to you, whatever it closes in your face. And this is how I faced it. Um, and I actually always lived my life not thinking about other people's opinion because it only brings you down. Um, when I had my cancer, I was like double now, not thinking about people's opinion. Uh, I just think about myself and my family, myself first, always. That's it. Uh, what, what I, I, I like it because this is a fear that very few um, doctors are mm -hmm. um, confident to touch this topic, yes, because they know they either they have no answer and uh, they even try not to touch this critical issue. What I sometimes tell to my patients, I tell them, I'm a gynecologist, okay? I'm a father, okay? But I know women, they're really happy with kids. And I have the experience, there are many, many women, they have no kids, but they are still happy. And I have the experience, I know many, many women, they have kids, but they are unhappy. And the same is with a man. So children is okay, but at the end of the day, you, you have to accept how is the situation. And at the end of the day, what you said, it's not what the people expect from me. So the only thing is at the end, your face in the mirror and how you can deal. And 
I can always say I'm not a psychologist, but the secret is to accept the disease, to accept the situation, but not to see only the cancer, but even to see what is healthy in you and what elements of health you can increase. Because even if you have a cancer, stage three, stage four, 99% of your cells are healthy. Otherwise, it's impossible to make a Zoom meeting, to dance, to run. But we are always facing on the environment, what the people expect from us. And second, to focus on disease. Even the doctors, they only talk with you about cancer, cancer, cancer. Because they even are not trained in health, they trained in fighting against cancer, but they ignoring the health. And that's what I really love. If the patient bring it to the doctor, but even the doctor not only focus on diseases. And what you say, yes, that's a situation. It's even hard because you have to cry to to even show emotions. But at the end of the day, you cannot change the situation. So it is, and then you can look what other opportunities are available. And so again, I'm, I'm really impressed and um, we will have maybe later talks on the other webinars about sexuality and all this is the same thing. Yeah. Um, but what you show is really so, help, so helpful and even valuable. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. I'm also wondering from a doctor's perspective, whether what your um, experience is, how much do you feel the doctor's role is in, in feeling the stigma and this shame when, when, you're, when you find out that you have this disease? What was your experience? You know, do you think the doctor played a role in, in that kind of feeling? Or do you think the doctor can make it, can make it better, can make it worse? Um, can I talk? <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, uh, personally, my own doctor, uh, he played like a tremendous role. I love him. He was very supportive. He even uh, told me, Joanna, we do this. We do the surgery. You go on, you live your life as if nothing happened. Just go and live your life. Uh, I know it's going to be difficult. He was actually more than a doctor for me he was like a friend for me i was lucky enough to have this doctor in my life and when the situation happened in lebanon i actually went to him and i told him please don't tell me you're leaving lebanon because of the situation mm -hmm. uh, he told me no i'm stuck and glued to you here <laughs> so i was happy to have him he's still in in the country so um, i absolutely believe that the doctor should have um a kind of emotional role in the situation with the, the patients because we reached a point because they see so many patients and do so many surgeries they become like uh, robots and uh, they just come and they tell you here you go you have this you're gonna lose everything you're not gonna have kids you're gonna have cancer you're gonna do have surgery you're gonna have chemo it's like we're we're living in a, in a robotic uh, procedure going on at, they make us forget that we are a human and uh, what, what we're going to face after finishing with the cancer. Okay, we we'd go, we do the surgery, we go, we do the chemo, the everything, and then life hits again. Mm -hmm. And um, this is what we expect from our doctors to have like a part of an emotional side, which I know is very hard for them because if they're gonna work on their emotions, they're gonna be like uh, a little bit uh, weak in front of the in front of the patients. But we ask, um, we really ask for this because having this along with your professionalism and uh, um, it will be like the whole package for the patient to uh, have more positivity and to um, going through whatever disease they are going through, not only cancer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joanna. I think this is a really important insight. And we also have obviously doctors in the audience. So if you if you want to comment, please feel free to comment in the chat. Um, I believe that um, empathy and professionalism 
are not mutually exclusive. In fact, they actually complete each other. And I think this is what we aim for as doctors, to be empathic, um, to support you, but keep our professionalism because in the end, this is what you need from us. You need us to be professional so that we can actually support you through your treatment, but obviously also empathic. And this is what we aim to, we aim to do. Some better than others, but it is also something like you said, Professor Suli, communication needs to be trained and learned and it comes also with experience. Great, thank you, um, Joanna. Um, I'm wondering from the, from, the, from the audience and from yourselves, ladies, how easy or difficult was it for you? I think, Joanna, you mentioned that you, you, you had second opinions from several doctors. How easy or difficult was it for, for you to get a second opinion in the uh, of your disease or your journey? Actually, uh, because um, we have so many friends in Lebanon, we are all very close. So this one knows this doctor from this country. This one knows uh, another doctor because he had someone in the family who had cancer and he went and see this doctor. So this is how it goes. They give you a name from here, a name from here. Uh, give me your uh, uh, file. We will send it to the States, this doctor. He will check it out and he will send us uh, uh, back a feedback. So this is how it happened with me. Uh, mm -hmm. I had nurses and at the hospitals that I know, they told me about the doctor who made my surgery and uh, other, the, other friends that they know in another hospital. And this is how it went. I went and I saw many opinions. And when I saw that they all had the same answer, then I went uh, and took the decision for the surgery and uh, the, the, sur the mm -hmm. surgery not as, uh, because, um, there was a way that doing the American way and the way they're doing in a French way where they cut all the, they cut you and they remove everything. And the other part when they do it with the, what would we call it? Um, I forgot the name. There were two ways of surgery. I can do, the, I can do it with the, the French way. They cut the, the patient and the other way is with like a-, a Minimally invasive. Probably. Excuse me? Laparoscopic. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So yeah. this is how I decided to go with the surgery, not the scope. Okay. I see. So you basically, it was your own initiative. You, through your own private network, you managed to find several doctors. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. okay. From, I can share uh, from my side as well, very similar to Joanna, because I was in Lebanon as well, but I was also looking for a second opinion, hoping that, like I mentioned, hoping that one of them would tell me that it's not ovarian cancer. You do not have ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, also through friends, I sent it to the US, I sent it to Europe. I, it was all over the place, but once everyone confirmed the, the, the diagnosis, but had minor differences in the treatment plan, then I was convinced that no, it uh, it's, it is what it is, and uh, it's, uh, it's that, yeah. Thank you, Sarah. So I think second opinion is really a crucial story mm -hmm. because, okay, you are very good connect, okay? But <clears throat> I can tell you in Germany, you, the cover, uh, it's covered by the insurance company, but they are still doctors who don't like that the patient go to second opinion. Second is, um, if I have sometimes patients from the Arabic region and they come to me and I tell them the option, I tell them this is one option, this is the second option, this is the third option. And even if I try to enroll them in clinical trials uh, where you can compare different things, uh, they are sometimes very disappointed. And they tell me, Professor, I came the long way to you because you know everything. You have to know what I know what I need to treat. And I tell them, a good doctor is a good doctor if you give more, more than one option, because nothing is only black and white. But they are not have this experience previously, because they read always to doctors, they tell them this or this. There's no alternatives. And this is even a challenge for the community to empower the patients, but even the doctors to pressure them to give opportunities. Because medicine is 
again, the science, but it's nothing that you have a must. I hate if a doctor tells the patient it's a must, because if you are a scientist, you know there are always limitations. So, and the question is, and that's the reason why we need even this digital support and the advocacy activities to empower patients to, to demand an option, a second option. And then you can even, as a doctor, to prioritize, but only to say there's one way for you. It's not fair, it's not fair. Mm -hmm. And we cannot only hope that everybody is connected with experts. And that's maybe the challenge yeah. and even the opportunities to go on um, this um, setting. So, and I would like, can, can I add just one thing? I, because I heard you speak, Dr. Sahule, once about looking at the patient from the whole perspective, like looking at her individually uh, or, or him individually and like taking a decision out of what that person, what that patient needs and according to her health, according, according to her history. And I think that's very important when you feel assured that a, a doctor looks at the whole perspective and looks at like your history of in your health and then take the right decision for you together with you. Yes, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a journey you go together and hand in hand, really. Um, and I believe as well what you said, that second opinions are basically part of the treatment. Would you agree with that? That you have the you have the option of getting a second opinion. And like you said as well, I, I have had patients that have come to me and have said, I would like to get a second opinion, but I'm afraid that my other doctor might get offended. And so, but it is part of the treatment, like you said, it's, it's part of it. It's may, maybe even a right. It's maybe more than the part of the treatment. It's mm -hmm. a signal of attitude. Yeah. So if I offer a second opinion, then I'm open to explain my recommendation. Yes. So we go in dialogue. Yes. Second is only to, to give him, it's a very big issue because second opinion is not second opinion. Mm -hmm. So what I say, if you go to a bakery, you always got only breads and cakes. Mm -hmm. But in cancer treatment, in general, you need at least a supermarket. And that's the reason if you go to somebody, give a second opinion, you have even to got a feeling about the competence yes. of the, because sometimes you've got 10 second opinions there without any value, mm -hmm. because there's nobody of them then treated once in a trial. But if you go to a doctor and you tell them, I like a second opinion and I will go tomorrow to another second opinion. And if this doctor refuse this, move, I would say go away from the doctor because it's, it's a bad attitude. Mm -hmm. And the second is even to explain the decision and even to give the opportunity, even if I have not the bread in my shop to look, say this guy has bread and maybe that fits to you. Not to only offer things what I only can control. That's the reason why we need networks, we need centers, we need interdisciplinary work. And again, Germany is not a Disneyland. Hmm. So we can learn from each other, but I know this is something what we have to change in the Arabic world. Yes. Because I know um, that's something different. And even 50 years ago, there was no collaboration between the societies without the centers, but we need you. And what you have seen now with the advocacy groups, 10 years ago, they were all of them isolated, all of them. Now they go in dialogue and they are much stronger. Yeah. And then they find a better way and to make access even to people who are not so educated or not so connected as you. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what needs to change. I mean, and this is why we do also tumor boards. These are the first steps in, in getting second opinions and in being able to not justify, but like you said, explain why you're recommending this yes, treatment yes. or these treatment options. Definitely. Thank you very much.
Um, I wonder if you have had experience uh, or what your experiences were um, with trials, clinical trials, whether this has been something that was discussed with you when, when you had your diagnosis or, or whether this is something you kind of looked at yourself. Um, what, what were your experiences with, with clinical trials in, in, within the context of your, of your diseases? Uh, honestly, I didn't um, look for it and uh, no one told me about it. So I didn't experience anything with this, uh, with this subject. Same, same for me, nothing. Hmm. Yeah, me too wasn't, you know, offered uh, or explained to me, but I am now on um, a part of an organization who is getting that information out to patients um, about clinical trials. So it's a part of, you know, my advocacy now because it just wasn't offered. Mm -hmm. Sorry, please. Yes, because I think this is a topic, again, like a second opinion, it's more the attitude, yes, to show, because if you participate in clinical trial, the file will be generally supervised, audited, and um, nobody likes that you've been audited and you looked on your surgeries and cancer trials, but in many regions, they have even no access to clinical trials because we need big infrastructure. But I know one of my first books uh, for patient was to explain randomization. Yes, randomization was a treatment and with non-treatment, and you have to motivate patient to go to trial where you maybe got not the experimental uh, drug. And that's the reason why many doctors have even difficulties mm -hmm. to explain this to the doctor, and they the computer will make the decision. They say, how, you, how the, doc, the computer can make a decision if you are a professor? So no, I want that you make a decision because I came to you. So what we try even to explain, but this even is a part of this, I think, network to bring even uh, innovation much closer um, to the patient. And this is the reason why trials are sometimes a very good instrument because the limitation to got approval in a country is very complicated. And even the education and training for the doctors, only if the drug is available, is too long because they have no experience in management, in indication, contraindication. So what we like even with PARSCO, with ESGO, with all the societies, to bring clinical trials to all over the world. And that's the reason why we are connected um, in this. But um, this, I know, is not simple, um, but um, there are different parts of service with drugs, with surveys, with questionnaires. So the study is something if there is a protocol and this run in a, into an ethical approval process, what it means to be audited and then to run in a systematic way to make it uh, transparent for the scientific community. So that can be one of the next webinars to explain what are the different levels of clinical trials mm -hmm. and even to demand participation, especially in rare disease. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's very important to be part of this uh, because the old traditional medicine is in many, many cases not really effective. And therefore, you need good, good networks. And not just with the rare diseases, but also ethnicity is yes. more and more of, a, of, yes. a, of an yes. issue in clinical trials, where yes. most of the population are Caucasians, and we need to, you yes. know, we need to apply to more ethnic minorities. And it can't be that, you know, the mainstay of a clinical trial are patients. Yes. And involving the patients at the very last in 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 educating them about yes. clinical yes. trials doesn't make any sense. And I know that NGAGE as well, um, you yes. have a fact sheet on the clinical trials and what clinical trials are, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. And as you can see, we're touching on some topics to see what can we do further, you know, where, where can we do further webinars on these topics and where would you be interested to kind of know more and, yes. and, and share more? Because ethnicity, personalized medicine, mm. the American are the first, they, they always make all the trials and they look on, on blacks and non-blacks. 
and Hispanics and Caucasian and Asian in Europe. Every patient in Germany is a German. Every patient in UK is uh, British, but that's not correct because you know metabolism is different and many many things. And uh, this is, I think, what we even have to bring into mm -hmm. uh, the com scientific community. Mm -hmm. And that's what is so valuable mm -hmm. uh, to, yeah, to, to go in dialogue with. Yeah, and there is obviously scope for that. We, we're having comments in the chat that, yes, uh, echoing um, the, the ladies, uh, what they said, that there was no information provided about clinical trials at the beginning, which seems to be quite a usual occurrence. Um, I would well like to maybe, Joelle, if you could maybe, because you're, I'm thinking about you because you were also a caregiver, um, about your experience in, um, in with, with your mom being diagnosed, about your experience with second opinion and maybe clinical trials. Well, we didn't have any um, with clinical trials per se, but we had uh, a few second opinions. Uh, of course, also through connections, through family, and um, and uh, also, and I would like to just share like something personal as well in this because uh, once you know ovarian cancer in stage four, it's pretty deadly. <laughs> uh, so you know you get you have hope, but still you just want to be realistic. So. That's also why we went through a second opinion. But what we re realized also in Lebanon is that most oncologists meet with each other and discuss their cases. And this also assured us, um, although we were in the, in the hospital where my dad used to work and he knew everyone. And so they assured him of this as well. And so we went to, uh, for a second opinion, but also in the end, my mom believed, and her doctor was actually not a very, he didn't talk much, <laughs> her doctor. So going back to the, what we discussed before, that maybe doctors can have more a uh, um, humanitarian approach <laughs> with patients. He didn't really have that, but he was a really good doctor. And so she told me, you know what? I want to survive. I want to live. I want him to do his job. I don't want him to talk to me. So that was her, you know, her way of dealing with it because she knew that she had to make this fight in the end as well. And if that was wrong or not, I mean, there is a huge discussing, discussion about that. But for me personally, I would have loved him to be a bit more approachable in, in this kind of communication. Just, you know, even if it's a deadly case, just to have that assurance of being able to talk to him and ask him questions. Uh, so yeah, second opinions are important, and I don't think that doctors should be offended. On the other hand, like if they really are confident in what they're doing, they should come together as well. And uh, so yeah. Thank you, Joelle. This is a very interesting insight from a caregiver and a relative's perspective. You know how you think. You know, for your for your your feeling was you wanted the doctor to be a bit more empathic, but your mom was quite happy. And so this happens very often, um, this, this difference in, in, in how you perceive things. Um, and I'm, I'm also glad to hear from your side that uh, the ladies were assured that their cases were discussed in these tumor boards, really. When you described oncologists met together, this is really what a tumor board is about. Yeah, exactly. exactly. These cases, and you yourself have participated or participate regularly in our tumor boards as well. So you know how we discuss the cases and, and that it's not just the gynecologist that sits there, but it's other members of the team who are involved in the patient care as well. Yes, exactly. And um, I believe someone, um, oh, Svetlana, Svetlana has raised her hand. So Svetlana, we're going to unmute you. And if you would like to introduce yourself, we're, we're happy that you're here and you're joining us. Welcome. You just need to accept the, uh, the unmute. I'm going to. Hello. Hello, hello from Russia. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad to see you, and uh, also I'm glad to participate in uh, Tom uh, in uh, our webinar. Thank you for 
for invite. Thank you for uh, Svetlana. I'm glad to know you and thank you, thank you a lot for Professor Siuli for my new life. Uh, I am very happy because uh, during five uh, five years, I'm happy and uh, do sport. Uh, I'm very activity, and I, I hope that my uh, life will be happy. And uh, I fight, <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy uh, now to communicate with you and uh, stay here with you. Thank you. Ich lebe. <laughs> Thank you very much, Svetlana. And you're the one who wrote the book. She, she yes, wrote, yes. Yes, and yes. Yes, yes. I'm very happy to, re, to write a book uh, about my new life, about my new uh, fate and my new experience. I uh, <laughs> thank you for Professor Siuli for our collaboration. And uh, now I wrote uh, a new book too. <laughs> Yes, and what is really wonderful, um, she was stage 4B and is now five and a half, five, five and a half years without any relapse. Yes. <laughs> I remember as she came in my hospital um, and she has a lymph node metastasis here and everybody yeah. was saying to her goodbye and I told her, I don't know what we can do our best together. Um, yes, I play tennis, I play tennis, I uh, ski, now I have a ski mountain and uh, do a lot, I am happy, I enjoy life. <laughs> and she participated in a clinical trial, yeah. mm -hmm. five and a half years, and now the treatment is one of the standard of care, uh, even US, but even in many European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, it's, it's wonderful. So uh, thank you, Svetlana, that you pick the stories and even to engage even women all over the world now. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for uh, our conversation. It's uh, really great and uh, very uh, impressive for me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Svetlana. I think you, you do more activities than me. You're probably healthier than me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I do my best. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And we hope to see you in our further activities with our patient advocacy groups. Yes. <laughs> So I think we're uh, we're coming to 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 the end of our webinar. Um, if there are any more comments, uh, any questions, you you have a few more minutes to to put them in the chat. Again, I want to take this opportunity um, to thank uh, Joanna, Sarah, and Nefetari for sharing their stories, um, for talking honestly and openly, and for really inspiring other patients caregivers, but also aspiring myself personally and other, other doctors um, around the globe. And we really hope to continue with you the journey um, to carry on empowering women, um, whether patients, relatives or doctors, um, and to, to work with you in the long term. Also, thank you to Petra for sharing the Engage activities and for continuing the work with Engage with Professor Sahuli, hopefully in collaboration soon with Parisco as well. And obviously, thank you to Joelle for coordinating and being the soul of the patient advocacy. Joelle, I'm very much looking forward to having you um, taking this, this part within the Parisco Society. Um, and I remember one of our first meetings was when I was in Italy and we were talking over the phone about our opportunities and what we can do together and thank you, thank you. it seems like a lifetime ago so I'm, I'm very happy and very proud really to have all of you here today um, I also thank you to our technical team our cameraman who was very inspired earlier on he does a lot of work <laughs> Uh, Karim, Karim Loretti is uh, today, he's also looking after the camera, 
but he's also been working very hard uh, for the social, he looks after the social media, the Parisco social media, I start social media, digital health, PR, and uh, he also coordinates the project with myself and Professor Sehuli, so he has a lot of patience. Um, so thank you again, everybody. Uh, thank you for everybody for joining. And we really hope to see you again soon in our next Women Empowerment webinar series. Professor Sehuli, thank you. And to you, the last word. <laughs> Last thank you. Uh, Joelle can make it because I'm really impressed. How oh, thank you. This is how to have this. And again, empowering is that you do your own thing so we can only support. Thank you. Okay, so and I'm, I'm really impressed and I, I love to make this bridge between Parsco and Engage. So I think that's the right people. Uh -huh. level. So we will uh, run in a series. I'm 100% confident. And I think yes, uh, so am I. Uh, I'm. Thank you so much for your kind words, Dr. Tawili, and for this great opportunity. And I want to thank everyone who is watching from all over the world, and our patients, and Petra, and everyone, all the doctors. I hope we all um, can take this opportunity to reach out to one another as well. Please feel free to reach out to us, to me, or to Sarah, or to anyone. Uh, we have put our social media in the chat, so you can do that through there. And uh, feel free to be anonymous as well. Just give us your feedback and talk to us. And we are here for everyone. And this is just the beginning. So I hope that we all have been inspired and empowered today. And uh, not only women, men as well. <laughs> um, you are also encouraged to be vulnerable and to have a cry once in a while. So. Please just uh, know that we all are here to support everyone. And thank you again, Dr. Sowell and Dr. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Good day and evening.